Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to uh, this course on human behavior and this is lecture number 17. The next two set of lectures will focus on advanced cognitive parameter which is called personality and then we will focus on something called social influences and social cognitions. Now, as we have been doing in the other lectures. Let us go a little back of how we started this journey of human behavior. So, we will do a quick recap of how we started off and how we have come to this idea of personality. So, the course started by defining what is human behavior and the necessities of studying human behavior. We started off by looking at definitions of human behavior, looking at why we should study human behavior and then focusing on the science of psychology which studies human behavior. We also enlisted a number of problems which lies with the study of human behavior. We looked at the historical antecedents to the science of psychology, the roots of philosophy and physiology which combine together to give the science of psychology and then a little bit of the history of modern psychology. We looked at techniques in psychology, methodologies which the science of psychology provide us to study human behavior. So, behavior we define as a reaction that a person does to any change in environment, person, situation, event, any of these. So, this reaction or behavior is a result of a number of processes. So, after explaining the introduction to what the science of psychology is, we started off by looking at those number of processes which make a person respond to changes. We started off by defining what is sensation, which is the process of detecting changes in external situation, external physical environment and transforming these changes, encoding these changes into a format which the human brain or mind can understand and that is what is sensation. We looked at parameters of sensory systems like sensitivity and sensory coding. We looked at what kind of problems may arise in detecting of these changes in the external environment and the coding and we then took a model system which is the human eye and looked at how whatever we have studied applies to the human eye. Once a change is detected in the external environment this and this is encoded into the psychological relay into the mind or brain, this change has to be given a meaning or a meaning has to be generated from this change and that exactly is the process of perception. So, so, we looked at what is perception, we looked at the five different processes of perception starting from attention to localization to the idea of recognition which is the three basic processes of perception and then two other processes which the human brain employs to make meaning and these two last processes of abstraction and constancy are fixed parameters or fixed rules which the human brain uses to make generate meaning. Once a meaning has been provided to external stimulus, this meaning 
or this knowledge has to be learnt, has to be engrossed and there we explained the process of learning. What is learning? We started off by defining different types of learning, the associative and the non-associative form. Within the non-associative we looked at habituation and sensitization, within the associative form we looked at observation learning, classical conditioning and instrumental conditioning. We looked at the parameters, principles, factors and other subsidiary requirements for learning to happen, for successful learning process to flow and be completed. Now, once certain knowledge has been learned, it has to be stored somewhere and that is where we started off by explaining what is memory. It is a system which not only encodes information or knowledge, but also stores it and then later on helps by a process of retrieval, helps us in defining situations, helps us in solving problems by a process of retrieval of information that has been learned before. We looked at different theorist who has proposed the idea of memory. We looked at the concept of attention Schrieffen and the dual process model. We looked at the parallel processing model. We looked at what is long term memory, what kind of informations are strong, uh, stored in long term memory and how these informations are manipulated, what are the characteristics of long term and short term memory and many other features of the memory process. Once something is stored, this can in, in situations where a problem has to be solved, this information has to be retrieved and transferred between people and the way that human beings transfer information is using language. Also the information has to be applied or used in ways such that problems can be solved out of it. So, two important processes were the next area of study which was language, a medium of communication between humans and sometimes humans and machines. We looked at the English language as a model system and describe the intricacies of language. We looked at the process of thinking which is how the human brain makes use of information which is learned to the process of sensation and perception and applies this information to solve problems. We looked at reasoning which is the process which helps in thinking and then we looked at the idea of problem solving which is how human being solves problem. Further to it, the next section looked at an interesting variable which is called intelligence, which is how people are divided in our societies. Some are intelligent, some are non-intelligent. Intelligent people do less effort to gain more, non-intelligent people have to do more effort and gain less. Intelligent people process information fast, non-intelligent people do not. So, we looked at the concept of intelligence. We looked at various theories of intelligence and we looked at the idea of whether intelligence is a unitary system which means one system in process or is it multiple system. Among the theories of intelligence, we looked at the information processing theory in terms of Anderson's intelligence theory, we looked at Stenberg's idea of triarchic theory, we looked at CC's idea of intelligence and we looked at intelligence as Gardner was have proposed as seven basic systems. Towards the end of that lecture, we looked at how intelligence is measured and what are the parameters and factors which affect the measurement and the idea of intelligence. The last two lectures were dedicated in understanding what is emotion. Emotion is an important cognitive factor which shapes our behaviors. So, we looked at what is emotion. We looked at how emotion is different from moods. We looked at the various theories of emotion. Not only that, we look, took apart a multi component part theory, a multi component model of emotion and explained all its part one by one and describe how emotion sets in. We describe how emotions not only color our feelings and judgments, but also colors our memory and attention. We looked at how 
responses are generated out of emotion and we also looked at how these responses are managed. Today we are going to discuss another interesting factor, another interesting topic, the topic of personality and how personality affects human behavior or personality influences the responses people give to situations. So, before we start defining what is personality, let us look at a small story to define what is personality. So, last to last year there was a school union in which I was a part of my school, my high school and obviously I did not want to go to that school union, but somehow I went to that reunion and in that reunion there were a lot of people, I did not remember anyone frankly speaking. But then this person, a chubby fellow, short in height with a lot of hair lost comes to me and says I am so and so. When I listened to him, his voice was seeming familiar, a part of cut of his face was similar, but he did not look like what he was saying, he did not look like whom he was claiming to be, which basically means that he had changed a lot. But when I tried focusing on the picture of the person, the image of the person whom this person was claiming to be, slowly it came back to me that it is the same person. Beside a number of changes in terms of weight gain, in terms of change in the hair structure, the basic facial structures, the basic ways of behaving, the same friendliness, happy go lucky kind of responses, the same risk taking attitude this person has is similar to the person he was claiming to be. And soon it dawned upon me that he is the same old friend that I knew from high school. The evening slowly started making more meaning to me as more people introduced themselves and I ventured down the memory lane in looking at these people. My behavior then to these people naturally changed, naturally was in accordance to the same kind that I used to behave earlier with these friends of mine from the high school. If you look at the story, this story basically says that people have certain fixed ways of responding, stable patterns of responding to situations, a fixed emotional reactions a fixed responses to events and this basically is what is called personality. So, let us start looking at what is personality, its factors and how it affects human behavior. To start with, I have two basic pictures, funny pictures which define personality and so the first picture says that how are you so obnoxious and the person says that this obnoxiety that this small girl has is because of heredity and so she blames it on personality. Similarly, on the other picture, this person says that I failed this personality test and the other person says you cannot fail it because your personality type is automation and so here again there is a definition of certain fixed ways of responding and that is what has been eaten upon and this joke created out of it. So, what is personality then? Personality is defined as a individual's unique and relatively stable pattern of behavior. So, two parts a unique, what do you mean by a unique pattern? A unique pattern means that although all the functions that we have studied up till now, memory, sensation, perception, language, thinking or any other process for that matter emotions may be similar across people meaning which a number of people or most people in, in this world would have these functions with them. But how do they differ among each other? Each person differs from the other person and that is the core reason for studying psychology. The one way in which people differ from other people is that they are unique in their responses and that is what this definition of personality says. An individual's unique pattern of behavior 
because each person does different behavior on different items and that is why it is called unique. And how is this pattern of behavior is not only unique, it is also relatively stable. What does relatively stable correspond to? It corresponds to the fact the pattern of behavior, the behavior that people are doing, the unique behavior that this person does or any person does to any reaction. For example, looking at cat, a person screams. Now, this person, this behavior which the person is doing to a cat is unique and relatively stable would mean that whenever he sees a cat, wherever it is, he will scream and this is called relatively stable pattern of behavior, which means that the response to a cat is always the scream. So, it is a relatively stable pattern of behavior and not only behavior, but thoughts and feelings and this is what is personality. So, what is personality then? The definition of personality has been defined as a relatively stable pattern of behavior, thoughts and patterns. Now, there are several questions that we need to ask here. Once or the famous question that has been troubling people for long is whether personality is real or not. The question that do people have relatively stable behavior? And if they have this relatively stable behavior, whether this is unique in nature. And the question of the fact that whether personality is real or not has been put to a number of tests. It is an age old question and there are two opposing views to the question of whether personality is real or not. On one hand are people like Walter Michel which argues that people show so much variability across situations that we cannot make any useful predictions about their behavior from personality. What these people suggest is that people's behavior across situation is variable, people's behavior vary across situations and this variation is so fast that any kind of prediction that is to be derived from these variations is impossible. They state that traits which actually make personality traits are relatively stable pattern of behavior that people do. And so, we will we'll look at the trait theory in, in a while. So, what happens here is that they believe that traits which form personality show only a model's correlation to overt behavior with only 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 percent correlation. So, what the first group says is that personality is not real. Why? Because the variability that people have in their behavior is so much that any kind of inferences cannot be drawn upon it. On the other hand, Personality psychologists counter the argument by Michel by holding that personality shows considerable consistency in behavior across situations. Another group of psychologists oppose Walter Michel's view and they say that people across situations show considerable consistency in their behavior. They believe that when an individual shows contrasting patterns of behavior in different situations, these actions may be functionally equivalent. The reason that they say how this is consistent is the term of functionally equivalent and these psychologists gives the example of an old woman who is altruistic. Now, if a small child who cannot work goes to this old woman, she gives him food to eat or money to buy food. But if a young man who can work goes to this same woman, she does not give him money or food, she asks him to do a job and only then she gives them food. Now, had the woman been altruistic, she would have given money to both the groups, the small child and the old man or the uh, adult. Why did she not give money to the adult? The reason is that her basic trait is altruism and so she knows that the small child cannot work and so she gives money or food so that this person, the small child can eat that food and not be hungry. When an adult comes in, she knows that this adult can work and she gives this adult some work to do. When he finishes the work, the old woman gives him money and what she is teaching this person through this behavior is self sustenance. She is being able to stick in both the ways and that is called the functionally equivalent behavior. So, in one case giving money, in the other case giving work and then money is actually functionally equivalent behavior of altruism. So, what these people say is that behavior in different situations are functionally equivalent for that person. Now, these psychologists cite that 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 correlations are considerably high comparing to the ones with carbon dioxide and global warming. And so, what these people state is that the kind of correlation that global warming and carbon monoxide poisoning 
is far below 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, but still people take it seriously. And so why should not people be taking the correlations of 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 between people's behavior and personality, people's relatively stable behavior or people's consistent behavior and personality to be true. So, let us then start defining what is personality and its existence. Weighing all the arguments and counter arguments, personality psychologists agreed that personality is indeed real and worth studying. And so, looking at all the arguments and counter arguments that we have done up till now, personality psychologists believe well that personality is indeed a feature that is real and that needs to be studied. Even Walter Michel has focused on personality styles or strategies. So, Michel himself has also focused on personality styles or explained something called personality styles, which he defined as it is the individual difference in the meaning people assign to various situations and events. Now, Michel believes that individuals show considerable consistency in this respect and such consistency in turn becomes kind of behavioral signature of these people. So, what Walter Michel says is that people are very consistent in terms of showing stable patterns of behavior and this is known as the personality styles. And this Walter Michel believes is the behavioral signature of the person showing the personality style. Now, the recent view believes that our behavior on any given situation is usually complex function of both our personality, stable internal factors which make us unique and situational factors. The recent view about personality is that personality is actually a combination of not only our stable internal factors which is the consistent behavior pattern but also situational factors which means that certain situational factors or certain factors related to different situations arising out of different situations are also responsible for our personality. And this basically is called the interaction perspective of personality which are held today by a number of psychologists. So, what are the basic theories of personality? How is personality viewed by different psychologists around the world? What we will do now is look at several theories of personality and how different people have actually defined the idea of personality. We will start by looking at the idea of personality given by Sigmund Freud and I am probably sure that most of you know who Sigmund Freud was. One of the most famous psychologists of the 20th century who died in the year 1939 after he flew from Vienna where he used to practice psychoanalysis. He was the originator of one of the most potent theory of personality which is called the psychoanalytic theory. Freud was a neurologist and initially he studied with Charcot in Paris where he was studying how epilepsy has to be treated. Later on when he came back from Paris to Vienna, he started working with a colleague of his and where both of them started finding out the neural reasons, the neurological reasons for certain kind of neurological problems. Freud slowly diverged from this line of a functioning or this line of medication and developed his own theory of personality which is called psychoanalysis. Freud believed that psychoanalysis or personality of a person can be extracted through psychoanalysis. And what was psychoanalysis? It is the procedure that Freud developed through which he believed or he came to believe by the use of this method on, on patients that most of people's behavior is the result of their unconscious. So, what Freud believed is that most of the human mind is unconscious, people are not aware of it and most of the behavior that people do or the personalities that people have, the answer to these personalities, the answer to certain behaviors or all behaviors for that matter which people do lies in the unconscious. So, let us take a jump into what is psychoanalysis and start looking at the idea that Freud proposed. It is a very strong idea been disproved by several people, but no matter how much you hate this idea, 
this is so trustworthy, this is so factual. Let us look at what this is. So, Freud's theory of personality, the psychoanalytic approach. Freud got his first inspiration for the view of personality by the works of Jean Martin Charcot and Joseph Breuer. Now, Charcot is one of those psychologists who used to work in Paris and Freud collaborated with him and went to his lab on a exchange program. There he started studying the neurological underpinnings of epilepsy and later on returning to Vienna, he started working with Joseph Breuer. Now, his theory of personality has four levels, which is level of consciousness, the structure of personality, anxiety and defense mechanism and psychoanalytic stages of development. So, Freud, he believed that people's personality, how does it develop? It develops from unconscious. Freud believed that most of the mind that people have cannot be accessed because it has no access to it, because it is unconscious. And Freud developed a method which is called free association, which was pitted against the idea of hypnosis for accessing the unconscious. What happens in free, in free association? So, what Freud did was he started his idea of psychoanalysis and used the method of free association. Free association, what Freud would do is let the patient lie on a armchair on a comfortable couch and he would give a word to the client as we call in psychoanalysis. And then he would just say a word and ask his client to come up or patient to come up with a word that comes to his mind as soon as he hears the word that Freud has said. This way what would happen that slowly the client or the patient would start speaking things that they would normally do not speak and whatever looking at the responses that people are giving, very carefully looking at responses, the personality of these people can be studied. Now, Freud based on these interviews in these patient doctor interviews developed his theory of personality. Now, Freud's theory of personality is divided into four parts as we saw. We will start by looking at what is the structure of personality, uh, then what is the levels of consciousness, what is defense mechanism and anxiety and what is the so, uh, psychosocial stages of development. So, the first step that Freud did, Freud believed that most of the behavior that people do comes from the unconscious. So, what is unconscious? Freud believes that the human mind is actually divided into three parts. There is something called conscious, there is something called unconscious and there is something called the preconscious. Now, Freud was actually a scientist and thus believed in the concept of thresholds in psychophysics. Freud believed that there is something called the threshold and even the mind has certain thresholds. Now, if you remember back to the idea of sensation, we looked at what is absolute and differential thresholds. So, Freud believed that the threshold of the human mind is very high and only very few materials actually cross the threshold. Other than that, most of the materials, most of the knowledge that we have, most of the information that we have is below the threshold. Whatever crosses the threshold remains in consciousness and whatever the information or most of the information which remains below the threshold is called the unconscious. Now, he believed that his psychological theories were temporary and would soon be replaced by biological and neural process. What he believed is that his idea was that psychological theories which define people's psychological functions are temporary in nature and as science progresses, each behavior that people do will be defined in terms of the biological and neural process. He reached the startling conclusion that most of mind lies below the surface of threshold of consciousness experience. So, what Freud defined is that most of the human mind lies below this a certain threshold which is called the threshold of consciousness. Now, above this boundary is the conscious consisting of the current thoughts. So, the mind is divided into three parts, the conscious, the subconscious and the unconscious and the conscious is only just 5 percent of what we know. So, all those informations that we are aware of, all those facts that we are aware of lies in the unconscious. Our memories, our experiences lie in the subconscious and anything other than that, all informations other than that lie in the unconscious. Now, beneath the conscious realm is a large preconscious 
subconscious or preconscious it has been terms have been interchangeably used containing memories that are currently not part of our current thoughts. So, memories or experiences lie in this whereas, conscious is what we know now. whatever we are aware of this is a conscious look at this model if you look at this model this part is called the conscious conscious contact with the outside world so we are aware of it below it this part this part that i am coloring right now is what is the preconscious material just beneath the surface of awareness and so this materials are like memories, thoughts, this is what you are aware of. And below this, as you can see, this large portion that I am now defining, this huge portion that I am now defining is basically the unconscious. So, unconscious, difficult to retrieve material well below the surface of awareness. Freud also says that all psychic energies originates in the unconscious. There are two kind of psychic energies, one is called the life force, the other is called the death force. Life force is the willingness, the energy of people to live, why they would live. And death force is that energy which is there in people which makes them think about death. So, that kind of thing arises from this unconscious and most people's behavior comes from the unconscious. Finally, beneath the preconscious and forming the bulk of the human mind is the unconscious thoughts, desires and impulses. Within the unconscious lies unconscious desires, acts, these are all immoral acts, these are all acts which cannot come to the surface. Within the unconscious lies a people's thought process, an impulse, ideas, knowledge which people do not want to interact with, do not bring to the forefront. Why? Because if they bring it to the forefront, they will be judged badly, they will be thought of as bad. Most of psychologists believe that human beings are born as evil human beings are born evil and so that that evil thought the evil acts are all which is hidden in the unconscious of which we remain largely unaware now freud believes that although some of the materials in the unconscious are preloaded most matters in the unconscious were driven to it by the process of repression of the conscious mind so how does the unconscious develop now we just saw that the unconscious is a huge part so how does it develop the unconscious develops some of the thoughts of the unconscious is preloaded. Some of the things in the unconscious comes from birth. But most of the things, most of the experiences that happen in our daily -day life, which we do not want to remember in future, which we do not want to carry with us in future, they are pushed back through a process of repression into the unconscious. For example, let us say that I have an ugly fight with someone and I do not want to like this person. I just do not want to like this person. It's, you often heard people saying that you do not exist for me. So, this fight which I had with this person and the ignorance that, that I have because next time I meet this person, I do not show that idea, that feeling that I have a fight with you and that is why I do not like you. So, this, this idea that you hate this pe person or the fight is actually pushed into the unconscious and within the unconscious lies this dilemma of the fight or the reason why you do not like this person. The next time you meet this person, you, you a sudden dislike will come up, but you, you would not be aware of why this dislike is coming up. And the reason why this dislike is coming up is because of the dilemma that is there, because of the fight which is there, which has now been pushed through the process of repression in the unconscious. The next structure or the next part of Freud's theory is called the structure of personality. Now, Freud's belief that personality is a three part system. So, initially the first part is that Freud believes that the unconscious or the human mind has three parts, one which people are aware of, one which your memories and thoughts and one that people are not aware of. What people are not aware of captures most of the mind and what people are aware of is only a fraction of it. Similarly, Freud believes that human personality has three structures. Anybody's personality has three structures, the id, ego and superego. Think of the id, ego and superego as 